So you wanted to speak about the Kursk Offensive? Fine, let's speak about the Kursk Offensive. Okay, this is another one of those go back to the aircraft videos and I'm going to do my best impression of an armchair general but I've been asked my opinions and my comments about the Ukrainian Kursk Offensive so here I am. Please consider that the events are still unfolding so we don't have certain information. I couldn't do the usual personal detailed research actually matching and checking the sources so uh, this is a bit of my impressions about what has happened anyway there will be a good deal of speculation so caveat apply I don't pretend to have the truth in my pocket in case you live under a rock or on the charger like Otis says the 6th of August in quite a surprising way the Ukrainian have started an offensive in Russian territory in the Kursk Oblast which is, by the way, the other side of the border from the Sumy area. The forces involved are more or less the equivalent of one army corps. For the offensive, they have selected three heavy brigades, three reserve brigades, and a number of other mixed units. And the total amount is probably around, yeah, eight, nine brigades, which is sort of the equivalent of an army corps. So it, this is definitely an offensive. The Ukrainians achieved a penetration of about 40 kilometers with the reconnaissance units, even though the area of firm control is probably much shorter, probably a half of that. The tactics that we have seen were somehow similar to the Kharkiv offensive in September 2022, with very fast attack columns moving ahead and around the center of Russian resistance. Not, not that there was a lot of Russian resistance, at least at the beginning. The border was just covered of border forces and police, paramilitary forces. All light infantry, really not a match for heavy units. And in fact, a few hundred of POWs have been captured in this operation. Another similarity with the Kharkiv area offensive uh, in 2022 is the fact that the Ukrainian made heavy use of Photoshop, actually showing on social media that they reached some villages where uh, maybe just some reconnaissance units passed through there without really controlling the village and this created quite a lot of confusion to the Russians. However, this was not an easy operation. They had relatively heavy losses. We have news of about a couple of advanced columns being ambushed by the Russians and being completely destroyed. Forces of the size of a company, more or less. For this offensive, the Ukrainians also collected mobile ex-Soviet air defenses that were available and they used to protect this sort of bridgehead in Russian territory, uh, obtaining some results. And in fact, we have news of a few Camo 52 helicopters and maybe a Su-34 being shot down. It also seems that they use quite an extensive electronic warfare coverage, which is sort of a first for the Ukrainians. And I would really be interested to learn more about it. We have also seen some results from the Ukrainian Air Force using precision guided weapons in Russian territory, which is, well, which is again a first. However, no F-16s have been seen. We will talk about the Ukrainian F-16 in another video. Apparently, they are keeping them in the western and southern part of the country, going nowhere near Kursk. Now, as I speak, the front line is being stabilized by the Russians, but it's not yet complete, it's not a continuous front, there are still gaps. And Ukrainians keep pushing this sort of raid quite deep into Russian territory, albeit they are probably not really getting control. Anyway, at the time of filming, they're still on the offensive. So, how was this possible? This was an operation that sort of changed or seemed to change in the public perception the momentum of the operations, the momentum of the war 
How is this possible? Because the Russians have had the initiative for many months now. Uh, so I have to say that Ukrainians have been very good at building up forces. However, we know that the heavy brigades that they used were not new units. They were units that were already engaged in other areas of the front line and they have been and they have been ordered away from their deployment areas to reach Kursk. Some other units came from the Belarusian border. However, it seems that Ukrainians are actually building some units in the rear, as we speak, but no new units or very few new units have been seen in this offensive. Now, we always said that the battlefield is now transparent and everybody knows what everybody else is doing, so how was possible to achieve this operational surprise? Well, it is because many of the units have been left in place in their old deployment areas till the very last minute. Apparently, the commanders, the brigade commanders, have been told of the operation three days before the start, and soldiers were just notified the day before. Now, the Ukrainians have obtained an operational success in the Kursk region, but the situation in the rest of the front line is more or less the same. The Russians are still advancing, they are still using their tactics, where slowly and methodically gain one settlement after the other, one tree line after the other, and they keep going. The salient around Avdivka grows every day. Vuledar, an important fortress, is almost on the point of being taken on the side, and many other areas of the front line are still active. So clearly this operation was an operation just to stop defending, just to try to reverse at least partially the momentum, because the Russians can't ignore an invasion of their territory, they have to do something. And I suppose that the Ukrainians do expect that the Russians will remove some of the forces that they have in the south to shore up the offensive in the Kursk area. There are already signs of units or part of units moving north, but for now the Russians have been used local reserves and the forces that already existed in the Belgorod area, in the neighboring the Belgorod area, that were never used in the offensive toward Kharkiv. So why did they choose Kursk? Well, because, uh, yeah, it's basically the only area where they could attack. This was an area that was very weakly defended. A relatively deep penetration was easy to achieve, and in fact, they did. And at the end, there is an important town and a nuclear plant nearby that could be real objectives. Obviously, this is not a real invasion. You can't invade Russia with nine or ten brigades. But it sort of embarrassed the Russians because, uh, let's say, they, they didn't see this coming at all, it's, and it is forcing them to react. Some said it was a sort of a gamble, and if those units end up being destroyed, they won't have anything else. But honestly, those units were already deployed, and the Russians were still advancing, so at least they tried to do something. In my opinion, this is too little too late. The one thing that could have hurted the Russian was attacking Belgorod rather than the south in the summer of 2023. But now the time has gone, but, and yes, the only option was the Kursk area. Anyway, it doesn't seem that the Russians are panicking at all. They are replying in a very measured way. And I personally believe that they will keep attacking in the Donbass. They will keep doing what they do, trying to break Ukrainian line and achieving a victory in the Donbass and when that happens then the Ukrainian will have to abandon Kursk. Some say that Ukrainian will abandon Kursk when there will be a serious counteroffensive just to preserve their units. They haven't done this before. They tend to defend everything way too much. So there is the risk that in case of counteroffensive the units that have been employed are going to be sacrificed just to keep hold of some areas of the Russian territory.
So, what are the interesting points about the character of the war and the operations that we have seen in this offensive? However, what are the lessons, the preliminary lessons that we can learn from this offensive? Well, the first is that surprise is still possible. It is very difficult, but it's still possible. And with surprise, maneuver warfare is possible again. In this case, though, there was a large disparity of forces. As I said, it was mechanized unit against light infantry and paramilitary forces. So basically, to have maneuver, you need to have an unprepared and weak opponent. And, well, I suppose this is not really news. A confrontation between near peer at ground level in this day and age tend to become a bloody, costly stalemate that is very, very difficult to win and very, very costly to win. Which means that in potential future confrontations where land, large land forces are involved, we may see this situation in which you have long periods of stasis and then sudden burst of activities. The other important lesson is that air defenses matter and a lot. The Russians could have easily have diverted the bulk of their air force toward the attacking Ukrainians and pound them to oblivion. But the air defenses that the Ukrainian brought into the area kept the Russian aircraft at bay. The Ukrainian also attacked by using long-range drones, few airports in the area south of Moscow, attacking logistic facilities, for example, Amo Depot, with some degree of success. And in fact, the statistics that I've seen, take them, as I said at the beginning, with a massive pinch of salt, are that the Russians do not drop more than 40 or 50 guided weapons in the Kursk area every day, which is below what they could do, honestly. It may be useful in reducing a little bit the effect on the rest of the front line, uh, but still it's probably not enough to completely defeat and stop the Ukrainian. But probably the most interesting element is the freedom that each side's drones have to access the airspace. We said that that type of light drones, like the Bayraktar or the Orland, were not going to be survivable in an area with real air defenses. No, it's not true they are survivable. The Russians have hunter-killer drones above the battlefield all the times, the Ukrainians as well, albeit probably to a lesser degree, but their drones have shown that they can penetrate in depth using the holes of the Russian air defenses and they can do some damage they can't be ignored anymore. Probably part of this survivability is connected with the fact that at the end of the day, the drones are relatively cheap and you can sacrifice them uh, relatively easy if they give you the intelligence uh, and the information that you need. But they still are a factor and they are a very important factor, particularly in terms of reconnaissance. They can cue all the heaviest and more traditional weapons like the Heimers on one side or the Skander on the other side, they can do really a lot of damage. So this is my assessment, this is my opinion. As I said at the beginning, a lot of caveats apply, so take this with a pinch of salt. Let me know what you think in the comments below because this is an ongoing discussion. But please be polite, just shouting Slava Ukraine or Slava Russia uh, is not helping anyone. So thank you very much for watching this short video. Thank you very much to all those who are supporting the channel on Patreon and by being a member. Now there is also GoFundMe available connected with my first book. Follow the link in the comments below if you are interested. So thank you very much for watching and see you next time. Thank <laughs> you.